Hello and welcome to our weekend walkabout. We're out in our gardens and yours for things that are happening, well, virtually anyway. Topic so, today is weeds. Um, we're going to talk about how you can beat them by knowing them. To know them is to beat them. And our company is Garden A to Z. That's our gardening company. Our website is gardenatoz.org. It's a work of love. Yeah, professionally, we are gardeners, <laughs> but uh, the, the website and this educational outreach is something we've been doing for over 30 years now because we are so blessed with information from being in so many gardens and realizing how much we learn by being in different gardens. So we hand that out to people and they give us back, you give us back so, so much, much information. Yes. Um, this is copyrighted information though. We want to share it with you. We want you to be able to share it with friends. But if you should decide to use it for a master garden meeting or a community tree planting uh, meeting, something that involves uh, an officialness like that, please contact us at our website. We'd like to know when those things are happening. Uh, That's me on the left with the camera. I and, do most of the pictures. And I've got the rainbow suspenders there. I do most of the words. We do swap back and forth, though. Mm. And today, as a special bonus, uh, we have a, a third host. She'll be silent, I believe. Um, the, the middle person there is our daughter, Sonia. She is a uh, excellent gardener. Both of our kids are good gardeners. She, however, developed a passion for it. She is also a, a professor at the University of Toronto, and in this group, present crisis very familiar with using uh, meeting technology so she's going to be working in the background to do the technical turning off and on the microphones etc for us thank you Sonia we're glad you're here we're not Scottish by the way I'm Russian and I'm Finnish uh, but we're now married into a Scottish family and I get to wear a kilt it was fun it looks cool yeah it was fun um, we don't look like that though we most often look like this because we do work in the garden um, and uh, there I am showing you weeds because weeds is what we're talking about today. Milkweed there uh, hanging from my suspender and ground ivy on the ground. Nuts edge in my hand. We'll talk about all of those weeds. We, we happen to like weeds. We respect them and we write about them. In our book, Caring for Perennials, there's a chapter on, on weeding and how to weed and yeah. take care. Yeah. So now it's your turn. Uh, a little bit of a test. What weeds do you see in this picture? We figure most people would notice the dandelion getting ready to open and already closed on the top part. And those of you that have had pokeweed before may have noticed it. it. Otherwise, I thought it was an ornamental, and I took the picture. And actually, it is an ornamental if you're in a particular part of the world. Uh, if you're in Europe, they treasure our native North American pokeweed, whereas we treat it as a weed. It, it does have, it is a beautiful plant, has a lot of interest in it, and the birds love the fruit. And so that's one of the reasons that we need to start today with talking about what weeds are, because it's not a clear subject. So we'll determine what weeds are, how you go about identifying the enemy. The, yes, and what we do about them. About controlling them. Which ones we hate the most. And we'll give you the chance to tell us which ones give you the most trouble so we can be sure to answer the most questions we can today. And questions are something that we'll bring up on the, on the screen a couple of times um, to, in order to give you a chance to take, the, uh, take this hand, raise your hand and take the microphone. Or you can chat your questions, uh, type them into the chat field as you think of them. Just don't hit return until you see the questions time so that we, they can pop up when we can actually handle them. This is the material that we have available for you to download on our site. If you go to our About Us and Webinars section, you'll find these handouts that you can download. It's, it's an outline to give you the basic uh, important points that we're going to cover today. But it helps keep us on track yeah. to know where we're at. So, we, yeah, so we'll be showing you the handout as we go along so that you can take a look and say, oh, I see where they are now. So starting, for instance, with what weeds are, it's at the top of the page there. Yeah, weed is a plant of absolutely no value, usually of a rank, nasty growth, and especially one that tends, it, it just wants to overgrow and choke out all your beautiful plants. But by gardener's definition, it is any plant that's growing where it doesn't belong, even though someplace else, other where, it's desirable. So I, I've been in lots of gardens with people where they say, oh, look at that. There's some purple cone flowers coming from seed, or there's some daisies coming from seed. And our 
our if, advice to you is if, uh, understand the definition. If it doesn't belong, it's a weed. It's a weed. If you don't need six of them in that area, if they're growing right next to something else, they're a weed there. So right. that leads you to another, taking a look at another group of plants here. Bring your garden tools in, sit down, have lunch, and look at them and tell me which of those there are weeds. By a lot of people's definition, Queen Anne's lace is a weed or a wildflower that doesn't really belong in the And area. red clover and sometimes asters when they get all over. Certainly that white thousand leaf aster <clears throat> sticking up in there is a, a problem for some people. So the one though that it shouldn't be a weed is goldenrod. Now it does, it is a, a plant that can spread invasively and can be a rank growth, but people consider it a weed because they say that they're allergic to it, and that is not the case. It, is, it is not an airborne allergen. Uh, the pollen is not pollen airborne. Is not the airborne. pollen has to be carried by a, a bee, or it has to be stuffed up your nose in order for it to bother you. However, Walt Disney, we blame Walt Disney for this, and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs turned it into a uh, despised plant because in the party, in the co Dwarfs Cottage, everyone is rocking and the music is going and... They're dancing and Dopey. Dopey comes bouncing in with this beautiful bouquet of flowers. For Snow White, and standing next to Snow White is Sneezy, who says, Gold oh, and, and, and proceeds to sneeze everyone out of the cottage. This is a very impactful, emotional scene three generations, four generations of people have seen it, so Maybe they blame more. goldenrod. Don't think that way. It's um, a beautiful native plant. It can plant. be a beautiful plant. But this is how, how subjective it is. This is a member of the Queen Anne's Lace family, the carrot family. This is Nigella, or Love and a Mist. It's a beautiful little uh, flower. I like the blue color. I like the, the fine texture. Yeah, it's an annual. It spreads itself around by seed, and, and those seeds can get to be quite prolific so that you get a whole map of them coming up and some people go ah ah get it out of my garden whereas other people like our friend will will says it's a weed of convenience mm -hmm. let it fill that area let, let it, it fill up you can you can pull it out even when it's little and while it was germinating he says it blocks out other weeds from getting started in there so everyone's got their own idea of what a weed is we love the amsonias they're called blue star they bloom blue in the springtime this is one of Steve's favorites. The willow leaf. I like it. It's it's a big plant. It's four feet tall, five feet wide maybe, and it gets a wonderful fall color. Yeah. But when you look underneath it in the fall when you're getting ready to clean up and there are six seedlings of it growing at its feet, you have to say, can you see them there with their thready leaves? Make sure you There they are. Yeah. But you got to look good. And you got to get them all, but you have, to, one. you have to Here's say, another. I don't need another set four of four foot, foot plants. plants in here. It will crowd out the old one. Why do we really care about weeds? Why spend the time? Well, if you're in agriculture, there's millions of dollars in, involved in weed control, probably billions at this point. And yeah, homeowners, homeowners spend a lot of money. And yeah. some of them are harmful. It pays to know which ones really are the allergens and which would cause your skin to erupt in blisters or and they destroy our gardens. Right, so we want to know about which ones are which. Um, we walk out into the lawn, people walk out into the lawn, and they go, oh, there are those violets, and they load up on herbicide to kill the violets. We get two tunnel vision over weeds, and all we can think is kill weed. When what I see right there is I see a lawn that's very thin. I can see through to the, the, the soil in many places, and that means that the grass is not growing thickly enough to keep the seedlings from coming out. There's even little holes in there all throughout, little holes, and those are probably starlings walking through, taking sod webworm out of there. So it, it might be the case that this grass needs better water, better fertilizer, maybe it needs more sun. It needs chlorinated, uh, mold longer. Right, the point is that knowing your weeds means that you know that these violets got there by seeding into the area, so you need to close the window for seeds to get going in there. Amen. And some people look at this picture and say, oh, how pretty. Uh, it's got cattail, miniature cattails, and iris, and the sea lavender. The sea lavender and, and, and but, but I look at it and go, ah, that darn manna grass again. We planted it on purpose because we thought, oh, there's a nice grass to put in our little uh, rain garden. Beautiful, ah. beautiful look, but once it gets, gets running like that, it, it loses its beauty rapidly, yeah. in our opinion. Um, now, ragweed, most people can agree, 
but it's not a particularly pretty plant. It doesn't bloom gold like goldenrod. It blooms a little whitish green color that no one notices and then goes starts going to seed like this. And, uh, and it is a problem plant. So see, people can agree and not agree on what's a weed. Most people agree that this plant is a weed. This is. Even though it's a native, it's a poison ivy. And, uh, and it does it. feed the birds and has value, but but it also, it's a dangerous plant, and, and you need to learn about it and how to get it out. Oops. No. Oh, did you want to show them the thumbs there, Steve? Yeah. We say that the three leaves often have thumbs that stick out on them. Not always, but often, and it's a good, good way to start IDing it. Yeah. This is another plant that people can't always agree on. They plant it on a little trellis in their yard, maybe a six foot trellis and say, oh, I've always wanted to have wisteria. And I love those blooms. Because yeah, they don't this know. This is not a tree in bloom. That's an 80 foot wisteria down wow. south. They are often called hysteria. Um, that's gonna kill the tree. It's, it will shade out the tree and prevent it from photosynthesizing. The tree will die. Now there'll be a dead piece of the forest with a huge vine hanging on it and falling down. It, it's not a good plant to have as a weed and, and you'll get very strong reaction from people who see yes. it do that. Same yeah. thing with kudzu. Oh, don't plant kudzu. You would be surprised at how many people have said, you know, I saw this vine down south and it like covers walls really well. I'd like to plant that. No. Kudzu no. covers everything. Be careful what you ask for. It's made its way north gradually because the plants are uh, selecting themselves for what's hardy and they're, it's in southwestern Michigan already. so. You gotta watch out for these plants. It's enough to see grapevines. So it, pay, it pays to learn from people what are weeds, what are weeds to them. This is a variegated sedum with a white edge on the leaf, and uh, it has reverted uh, to the all green portion in one eye. And that all green part, because each leaf has more chlorophyll than a leaf that is partly white, that's gonna grow faster and it's gonna overgrow the plant. It is a weed within the plant. That means it's gotta go out. Yep. So identifying the enemy has to do with studying them, and we do this, so. In order to control them, you have to know your enemy. Thank you, General Patton. You know, yep. get inside their head. They're not any different than other plants. They need certain amounts of light, like crabgrass has got to have sunlight. Um, other plants need to have a lot of water or need to have a rich soil. Crabgrass shows up when people take down trees. They go, why do I have this crabgrass problem? Well, because you had a tree there for a while, the grass got thin underneath it, there's seeds in there, sometimes 20 years ago, the crabgrass, and now you've let in light, and the light was the key. Um, and the seeds that are, even though they're just a little bit under the soil, they, they oh, sense that light. They can live 20 years in the soil crabgrass seeds. They can wait that long. And the presence of particular weeds can tell you about your site. It can tell you that it's a wet site, that you've got a hard pan underneath, and that's why the scouring rush is getting ahead of your other plants because it can grow where the water is, is backing Standing up. And wet. Yeah. yeah. So, this is one that I thought was in the lily family. It, it, it's in the orchid family. Yeah, but I thought it was a lily. <laughs> its name is Helleborine or false Helleborine. It belongs in Europe. Eurasia, but it's made its way into North America and has been making its way west across the continent. It shows up and people think like Steve do. Huh, it's a lily. It's a lily or what is this? No. variegated or Solomon seal. What is this? Um, and they let it go. Well, it spreads not only by runners. There is a runner root that comes off of that cluster of roots and can go quite deep and be difficult to get out of your woodland garden where it likes to be. Um, but it also spreads by seed. We've written about it, and this is this, the flowering stalk, which also convinces people, oh, it must be something. Yeah. But it spreads if lots it flowers, it must tiny be something. seeds everywhere, and they, they come up. So you want to learn when you first see something. If it's not something you know, learn what it is. Or try to. This was uh, relatively new a, a little while ago. And we said, now where is this coming from, and what is it after all? Looking at the flowers is one way to tell what something is. People send us pictures all the time. This happens to be in the aster daisy family. And uh, you have to wait for it to open up to find out that it is a lettuce. It's a wild lettuce. And for whatever reason, a bunch of it shows up somewhere. Did someone go by with a armload of a plant and scattered seeds behind them? Did uh, some temperature weather thing blow them in? Who knows, but sometimes weeds show up and uh, it, it's good to figure out what they are rather than let them grow. 
So it also really pays to know what the roots of a weed are like. So when we take things out, Steve and I don't just take the top out and identify it. We get the roots out. Yeah, as much of the root as we can. Because we want to see if it's a running root. So this is a running root. You can see that it is uh, a rhizome, that white rhizome. It has roots, uh, hair roots along the way that can also become sprouts that come up. This happens to be a running grass. And some roots are tap roots. This is the root of cheeses. Uh, it looks an awful lot like hollyhock when it comes up and people say, oh, look, some hollyhocks came up in my garden. Cheeses is another European weed and uh, there is some uh, application of its leaves in making cheese uh, um, in, in the, getting the active ingredients going so that cheese will form. But it has an incredible tap root. Once you see that, you realize this is not one that I can let the seedlings hang around for a while. The longer the tap root, the harder it is to get it out, it seems, right, because over time. Yeah. Most tap rooted plants are like dandelions. And I think almost every gardener in North America knows that if you yank on a dandelion and it goes snap, it will be back. That every piece of that tap root broken off in the soil can grow back up again. And almost all tap rooted plants are the same way including your good tap-rooted plants, the things that you want to grow in your gardens, like butterfly weed and, and uh, um, balloon flower. Uh, this seedling that I've got my fingers on here is a red root pigweed. And pulling it up, you go, no wonder they call it red root pigweed. The whole stem is red on the bottom. Um, it happens to be an edible plant related to some of our grains, that uh, amaranth that we grow. But it's something that you look at and say, okay, this plant grows only in the sun, only in warm soil, and only in really rich soil. Um, the sandier the soil, the less chance you're going to have it. So sometimes a mulch that is not <coughs> rich will stop red root pigweed from coming up. It's amazing how you find out what they like and don't like. Them. Okay, so time for questions before we keep going on because we have a lot of examples to give you and we'd like to use examples that you have. If you have some question that's relative to weeds, especially something that tells us what your worst weed is, raise your hand or type it in the chat. Here we go. We have Julie Lyons telling us that purslane is her worst weed, no matter the fact that people eat it. Its succulent nature and prolific seeding makes it so hard to control. It is a prolific seeder, but it is a warm season plant. And with a mulch put on when it's cool, um, you can stop purslane from coming up. Uh, and so it's one of those things that it is nice to know. And yes, it is quite edible and good vitamin C. <laughs> Steve is looking to see. Uh, lesser celandine. Lesser celandine. Lesser celandine or some of the, the buttercup family, the creeping buttercup are terrible. Wild onion, we're going to talk about. Lady bells, yes. we'll talk about. Bind Bind weed, we'll, we'll talk, talk about. about. Thistle, so, we'll yeah. talk about. Yeah. And bit, we'll talk about. Uh -huh. And Wanda would like to know if we ever recommend, we'll have to scroll back up to get a question in a minute. But this is great, you guys. Hutinia, and it's even spelled correctly. Wow, Bitter I am nightshade. so amazed. Bitter Nightshade, okay, that's uh, on, our identification list. Docs book. on our loss. Yes, we do have a weed identification book. We'll show this to you closer up a little bit later, but this is Weeds of the Northeast, and it is one of the best and written by some of the best, but we'll show that to you a little bit later. Harry Bittercress. Oh, bed straw. We don't have bed straw or cleavers on the list, so we'll add that mm. in. Can we spell the cheese weed? It's actually spelled cheeses. Um, and let's see, it is a uh, malva. I can't think what its botanical name is, except that it is a malva, M-A-L-V-A. Jewel weed or lady's thumb. Quack oh, grass I saw go by. Bishop weed. I have to go okay. get my glasses. Okay, oh man. Forgot about classes. Why don't rabbits eat purslane instead of echinacea? Um, maybe the rabbits realize just how wonderful echinacea is as a uh, immune system booster because the groundhogs and the rabbits and the deer definitely go for that. It's also true that echinacea is native here in, the, in North America anyway, whereas purslane is not native and maybe they've just not got a taste for it. Um, something that looks like bamboo in wet areas uh, single stems uh, all around. Actually, that's probably the hall, tall horsetail. Oh, horsetail. Yeah. Do you ever recommend removing an entire area of plant materials, including flowering on it, because weeds are so bad? Yes, yes. Wanda. We, uh, and you might want to take advantage of the fact that the recording for improving your garden is on YouTube on our garden channel. 
Janet at Garden A to Z because we, we uh, explain just how we go through an area and clear it out. Please, Chief and Charlie, mare's tail, mare's tail, probably horse's tail, horse tail, we got that. Bitter nightshade vines, and uh, we will deal with bitter nightshade vines and how we get rid of them. I, I, I don't mean to demean anyone's relationship with their weed, good or bad, by saying some of the things that I do, but nightshade is one of the easier ones to deal with. Um, it, uh, it is spreading mostly by seed, and once dug out, is a little we, easy to get out. We'll Therese has a hand up. Okay, let's Therese, let's see what we can have to say. Here you go, Therese. Hello. I'm sorry, I asked my question about the book, and I meant to put my hand down. Sorry. Okay, there no we go. No problem. We're set there. Thank you. Um, a thing that comes up, lots of little circles, pretty light flowers. That would be one of the cresses. There are lots of cresses right now. They're in the mustard family, and bitter cress, and hairy bitter cress, and lesser cress are all blooming right now. Little teeny tiny white flowers, little circular arrangement of leaves. They're actually a very neat little plant. Creeping clover, star of Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Oh my gosh. Star of Bethlehem is definitely those it's bulbous. A bulb. Well, we'll deal with bulbous plants and we're going to use that one as our example. How do you deal with milkweed? Oh. Huh. Well, there is always the option of moving to another property um, if you have milkweed that's run amok. But otherwise, it's a matter of saying every year, I'm just going to try to contain it to a certain space or I'm going to seriously try to eradicate it, which usually means leaving the area fallow after you dig it up. That means you dig as much as you can and you smother it. We'll deal with that one too. Japanese knotweed we'll talk about. Okay, yeah, Japanese yep. knotweed. Bittersweet, we weren't going to, but we've got to, we can show it to you and talk about Ooh, that we one too. Have, though. Sweet woodruff gone wild. Now see, that's one of your invited plants gone crazy, isn't it? Um, ground covers, we ask them in to cover the ground and then we get mad at them when they cover the ground. So for instance, when we, uh, when we proceed through the rest of the talk here, you'll see this list a couple of times. Let's see, Stephen, we were talking about um, little bitty, uh, go to bitter crest. There we are, under annuals, the annual weeds. So this is bitter crest. Um, this picture is there to show you that that's pea pebble that it's with. It's just a tiny little thing that fits on a couple of pea. A couple of yeah. oh. uh, here's a pet one that I brought in so we can take a picture and watch it bloom. You can see the white flower buds are just starting to come up, but it's it's quite a tiny thing. Fits in a Dixie cup, but it started growing in the fall, which means that it's already made seed pods that survive through the winter and are getting ready to open at the same time that new flowers are starting. So it's called a winter weed. There's your seed pods on it. They extend themselves up. So we'll what we'll do is we'll look at at these things as we talk about how to control them. And then Steve will take a hey, list. I'm yeah. on a webinar. Hello. And it looks like we have a microphone that we'll, we'll need to, uh, uh, so whoever, whoever has joined, we are taking control of microphones so that we can, uh, that's okay, Steve, we'll let, okay. we'll let our co-host do that. Yeah. Okay, so give me back control of the screen, please. Yes. There we go. Okay. So you nominated your worst weeds. I think almost all of those were, uh, we've got under wraps, they're on our list and we'll use them as examples. Um, having garden for people for, this is our 40th year now gardening professionally, we have brought home every weed that everyone has. Um, good weeds and bad weeds. The tall one standing next to me is a pokeweed and it's not even as tall as it can get. No, no. Um, Lychnis cornaria or scarlet campion is at its feet and is one of those plants that you invite in and then say, why did I do this? Sitting on my foot is perilla. Some people call it wild purple basil. It is not. That came in on my boots from somebody's garden and the seed just started coming up. Uh, crawling, let's see, I've forgotten what's in my hand, a piece of, uh, a piece of barnyard grass. Uh, uh, laced around my suspenders are some, is some wild buckwheat, fortunately not bindweed. Lamb's quarters and uh, um, red root pigweed next to me. So. The more you garden, the more you're going to meet weeds, and it's it's then just your own choice of which ones you decide are your worst weeds. Grapevine can be a terrible weed. It's a native plant, the birds like it, but it can climb over the top of everything, and uh, and you do have to learn about it. You have to learn that it's a long-lived woody plant. That's why grape, why orchards are such good. Except, yeah, 
And if it's big enough to climb up your 20 foot tree, you're probably going to have to find the places where the trunk goes into the ground and treat it like a tree. You're gonna have to saw it off. You're gonna have to kill it repeatedly yeah. or it sprouts back you up. You may have to paint where you sawed it. If you use a herbicide, yeah. If, if you decide to use one. But the point is that if you know it, you can deal with it a lot better than just continually pulling it off the top. You'll say, I need to get to the trunk of this. It is a woody plant. And then you can use the vines to decorate. Yeah, we uh, every time I pull grapevine off of somebody's uh, trees and shrubs, I wind it up and bring it home. But the idea is on most of these weeds, your best defense is going to be early defense, is to see them when they come up as seedlings in the middle of your father gilla and say, I got to get that out of there. And your best weapon there, your best tool, is your eye. Gardeners have a great eye for leaves. Other people might walk right by and not even notice these grape leaves. I hope that you do see them. In there. Yeah, yeah nice. here I am saying that other people, um, but believe it or not, some people don't see those. We do, and that's a great tool to, to sharpen. So starting with annual weeds, things like purslane, and crabgrass, and chickweed, and lady's thumb, which is one of the knot weeds, and speedwell. These are plants that every single year, if you know that it's an annual plant, it is growing from seed every year. And so your defense is going to rest around stopping seeds from germinating. Um, yeah, just because it's an annual doesn't mean it's little. This is velvet leaf. And it's a big plant. It's a weed of agricultural fields. If you live near farmland, you probably have seen it more often than people in other places. But most people, this is at a, this is at a, a, a residence in Detroit that's coming up here. And uh, you can see little, not, they're not very showy flowers. They're a little bit of orange there for a minute and then they get pollinated very quickly. And a lot of people will notice these seed pods and they think it is something. And they think it is something for long enough that that seed pod becomes brown and dry and drops seed and then they're in trouble. Then they've got it. If it's an annual, you need to stop seed from sprouting. And the way to do that is to stop seed from falling. So once you know it's an annual, that's a plant that you can keep cutting and cutting okay. and cutting. And it'll keep producing, yeah. but you have to stay on top of it. Um, there are people who've said, well, there, there's sunflowers coming up because there's a sunflower on the right. Its leaves all chewed up by a beetle. Um, and there is the velvet leaf on the left. And so you can understand why people might confuse them, but you're never going to find a sunflower flower growing on the velvet leaf. Small flowers. Um, perennials, this is perennial, uh, perennial grass. And it's just a seedling, but they're both seedlings, the one on the top. Generally, if it is perennial, you're going to see a great deal of root happening before you see top happening. If you compare that to the amount of root when you pull up a velvet leaf, for instance. That well, previous picture, you only saw a root mass that was about that big for the plant that was taller than Janet. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times you don't have to know the plant for sure, but you can say, I suspect you're a perennial. You're putting an awful lot of energy <clears throat> into root first before you put it into top. Some um, weeds, people, this is, there's chickweed in this lawn and there's a dandelion right in the center of the picture there. There's a, there's a dandelion and all around it, a small round leaf running around in there is chickweed. Uh, people will say, oh, that chickweed, it's always there. It's a perennial. No, it's an annual, but it's what's called a winter weed or a cool season annual. It germinates in the fall and in the late winter. So if you know you have chickweed, that's an annual and it's a winter weed or some other winter weed, then you know that you have to do your weed control in the fall. You can't just pack it up, put your tools away and go in in October because in November, the, the bare ground is going to be rife for chickweeds. Yep. So there's chickweed a little closer. People will come out and they'll just find the whole area covered with this foamy, flat chickweed. There's also mouse-eared chickweed that doesn't have quite such a point at the end of the leaf and is a fuzzy, uh, a fuzzy leaf. Um, the flower can be pretty, but <laughs> yeah, actually, chickweed's got the little white flower. Yeah. The um, speedwell has a pretty little blue oh, yeah. flower. I like all flowers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Purslane. Um, so here's another annual. Hey, with look an, at the amount of root. Yeah. Compared and it's to the top. A, yeah, and an example of a succulent annual. This is an annual that germinates once the soil hits about 60 degrees. Before the soil temperature gets to 60 degrees, 
you're not going to see purslane. So if you can act early when the soil is cool now on the areas that have purslane, that have been purslane problems, like between the cracks and the sidewalk, even if that means covering them with boards, even if that means putting something hard across them to keep them from germinating, you can get a lot ahead of them. Mm -hmm. um, it's also a real good idea to, to realize that all of these weeds have flowers, even if it doesn't look like they have flowers, and to leave them laying around when they have water still in the stem and flowers here. So there are flowers there and there are seed pods. There's one sticking out in the middle, Steve, right there. There's already seed pods there. If you leave that, leave, that weed laying around after you pull it, it's dropping seed for next year, and your, your defense against annuals is defense against seed. And that's definitely the case with crabgrass. Crabgrass, it, you notice how it's spread out. The weed didn't, it didn't, it doesn't stand up, it spreads out. That's so its seed goes outside of, of where it's growing. Yep. And, and there's open area because it's it's growing so dense in the middle that there's no open area. Yeah, so. it, starts, it starts killing off the grass for its density, but it also will root at the nodes. So where those uh, grass leaves are joined to the seed stalks, there's a node there and it'll root itself. The longer you leave it in, the harder, harder it, it is, is to get it out. But most important with crabgrass and some of, some of the other annuals, many of the other annuals, is that those seeds, look at the um, turkey foot shaped those are, each of those is a long skinny seed pod with several dozen seeds in it. You look at that and say there are hundreds and thousands of seeds that each crabgrass is dropping. And those seeds can remain viable for 20 years in the soil waiting to come up. It's important to get crabgrass before it looks like this and to identify it early by its wide fuzzy leaf in your grass and deal with it then in your garden or in your grass. Pull it kill it, smother it. It doesn't handle uh, shade well at all. Uh, use a herbicide if you will, but get it early. Don't let it go to seed. Um, lady's thumb is a knotweed. Uh, it is, um, let's see, like jewel weed, it is a plant of wet, wet places, so ditches, marshes, edges of the lake. Uh, it's an annual plant, so it comes up from seed the flowers are pink. There's the lady's thumb on this one there at the end. Um, it is a good pollinator plant, but it is something that comes up in such huge numbers that people say, God darn that lady's thumb, God darn that, that jewel weed. It's coming up everywhere. Um, this is one of the weeds that my friend Will calls a choose your weeds weed, because since it does come up so thick, it actually, when it germinates, stops other Others. things from coming up in that area. It's a living mulch and you can come in before it goes to seed and pull it out or cover it up with some paper or some mulch to kill it off. But you have to look at the fact that nature abhors a vacuum and it's going to put something in something. it. And sometimes you'd rather have an annual nice weed. Creeping Speedwell gets little tiny blue pretty flowers on it. Very pretty. That it's a winter weed also so it looks like a perennial because it's there already in the spring when you get out, but it germinated last fall. So just like the chickweed, it's something that you have to deal with in the fall. There are weeds that are biennials. By biennial, the first year they generally have just foliage and then produce their seed the second year and the mother plant dies back and the seedlings replace it. And, uh, and you have seedlings and flowering plants every year once you get them around. Um, Queen Anne's Lace is a perfect example of, a, of how a biennial does this. The first year, it, and this is the first year, the first year it just makes a whole lot of leaf and socks away this, the starch that the leaf is making into, into, that the, root. into that tap root, which is a carrot. Queen Anne's Lace is the species that we grow as carrot. The second year, it's going to give you the flower, the Queen Anne's Lace flower. Now, you could eat this, I've tried. Um, it does not taste good. Um, over thousands of years, people selected for carrots that were sweeter than this. So although it's the same species and it is edible, you would eat it only if, um, only if, uh, what was Scarlett O'Hara's 
uh, plantation. Tara. Tara was, uh, she went back and said, I, as God is my witness, I shall not be hungry again. Yeah. yeah, that's when you would eat this. So it's putting away all that energy into the root, making the root longer and longer. The time to get a biennial is before it flowers and preferably before it gets a root so thick that it's hard for you to get it to out. To get out. You know, because it, yeah. Mullen does the same thing. Sharon Bass sent us this picture, which was the most beautiful Mullen picture we'd oh. ever seen. So we're using it. It is a beautiful it. plant. I yeah. mean, it, it's got structure, it's got texture, it's got interesting yeah. flowers. And there are, there are hybrids of this Mullen that are ornamental plants, uh, but it's a biennial. It's coming up to flower in, in this picture that you're looking at here. It's going to get a tall stalk on it with little tiny yellow flowers on it. Um, in its year before it flowers, the leaves are even bigger don't come up high. They stay down low. It looks like a big felty hosta. But it too is a biennial and the time to get it is before it flowers now. And guess what? Now it's wasting all of last year's root in order to come up tall. So before it flowers in the flowering year is the easy time to get all the root out or when it's young in its, in its leafy year. <clears throat> then there are the perennials. Perennials reproduce from seeds or running roots. Um, the dandelion is an example of seed, but it sprouts from the root pieces. Right. It doesn't run around. Um, it moves around by seed, but it can just certainly come back if you leave a piece of root. Whereas in the ground. Canada thistle is a vigorous runner around, and then it throws seeds on top of it all. Yeah, yeah. So it can come from seed, but most of the time, Canada thistle comes by root. You know, it's a terrible, terrible thing we do to countries to name something after them. <laughs> Canada thistle is not Canadian. It's not North American. It came probably with the Vikings up to the Maritime provinces way back when and was already in the Great Lakes when the people who were exploring and sending plants back to Europe found it and called it Canada thistle. So now people are cussing Canada yeah. as they say Canada thistle, but it's not Canadian. And there are lots of plants like that. Quack grass also came from Eurasia and grows by seeds and also the roots, uh, the roots spread like wildfire. Bindweed is native. Um, there are three bindweeds that are native. The uh, Native Americans called the great bindweed man underground because the storage root, the big part of the root, could be six feet in the ground and could be as big around as a man's leg. Huge. So, and you think you're going to pull that root out? Yeah, you're not going to pull it out. You're going to starve that root out. And that's going to be part of our defense against perennials is we can take out what we can see of them, the seeds, we can stop the roots, we can stop the seeds from falling. But we have to know that perennials are, are going to survive. That's the way that things go. And so we're going to have to starve them out. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to, every time after we take them out, go back and look for them and cut off all the green before they can make new energy to make more room. We will show you some of that coming up. Yeah. So, so dandelion, you know when it snaps, it's coming back. Especially when they're that size. Also a very edible plant. Yeah. Cool plant to photograph too. Right. So if you've got bare spots in your lawn, guess what? These guys, bare spots that are sunny. It's sunny. Not it's... good in the shade. Yeah. And they bloom very early in the year and they'll bloom very long. And coming up all around this one is someone's worst weed, touch me not, yeah. jewel weed coming up all over in the wetland. Now these do like the dandelion, so I wish that we would let them flower and then somehow <clears throat> get them, get the seeds because yeah. it is important. It's an important pollinator. I think there's a lot of great pollinator plants. Yeah, well, so in our, our neighborhood. There's our thistle which uh, has uh, spines on it and drives people a little bit crazy. Canada thistle, uh, as it's called, is on the left. It's quite spiny. It will hurt you when you go to grab it and pull it out. It grows by running roots. You can see the root running off to the side. And then as soon as it gets out from underneath the shade of the mother plant into warm soil, it, the root stops making root and starts coming up. Uh, south thistle is another running root thistle with a yellow flower instead of a pink flower. Uh, and then bull thistle is as is spiny or spinier than Canada thistle, but it stays in one place. It's a biennial. It, it just doesn't move around. It, it's a lot easier to control. Yeah, it's the one that I'm in charge of in my yard uh, uh, based on what my grandkids say. 
Grandma, there's one of those picky things over here. I'm in charge of Your all the picky things. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Canada thistle, which the bees like, and the uh, uh, goldfinches like the seed, but it is not native, and we don't have to put up with it. These are the leaves that you might think are dandelion. Those are the leaves of sow thistle at the base of the plant. Sow thistle getting ready to sprout up and show its true nature. Sow thistle doesn't have spines on it. It doesn't. looks spiny, but it's not. Yep, yeah, there's sow thistle. I can hold it with my bare hand. Wouldn't want to do that with Canada thistle no. and bull thistle. But the running thistles are the problem. They will run, as you see here, to the side and come up. And as time goes on, as the colony gets older, they will branch down from those roots and make two layers in the soil. So the longer the thistle infestation has been there, the deeper your colony of roots goes. Earlier is the better time to get Canada thistle. And if you've got a big infestation of Canada thistle, making sure that you get the younger outside edges and work your way back toward the center is a good thing to do because you want to keep it from spreading until you can get back and find the mother load. Lots of root and every little piece that could break, if it's got a little hair from it, it could yeah. start right back up. We were going to show you video today, try live video to see how well we're working on it. And we're working on it. And the video that we chose to show and we'll put up separately is um, bringing, is, is loosening thistle from an area where we've been digging it out, where we left just a, a one inch piece of root that left there. And now we dig it out and it's a six inch shoot coming up with green on the top. Yeah. There's a lot of starch <laughs> in that root. The leaf is about 90% um, water but the root is probably more like 60% water. So there's a lot more starch stored in that root. One little piece of root can make dozens of leaves. It, throw, if you throw it out on the driveway and you watch the leaves just shrivel up and the roots barely shrivel up, they've right, yeah. got so much other things in them. Yep. So you can see that you might be able to see the nodes, but the blue arrows, those are what can come up if the plant needs to send them up. And that's what we have to stop from happening. If you've got a running root perennial weed, what you're going to do is get as much of it out as you can. And then you're going to patrol to make sure that when that shoot hits the surface and begins to turn green, which means it's photosynthesizing and making new sugars and starches, as soon as you see it, you cut it off, mm. which means the plant wasted <coughs> that energy. Kill the green. You just keep killing the green until you starve the root out. And there could be a lot of little green coming from some of these. Yeah, this is a this is an ornamental plant that we invited into our own garden um, called uh, Scotch thistle. It, the flowers are wonderful. The leaves are blue gray. And it's an annual thistle that gets to be six feet tall and is deadly enough to kill. It does hurt small animals walking by. Yeah. Yes. So there's lots of there are lots of thistles. I like the Scotch thistle because I would put up with it. It's the one that's on the. Uh, many coat of arms in Scotland, in Scotland's older families, because supposedly uh, a moat, or a dry moat around a castle filled with Scotch thistle saved the day when the Vikings came to invade and had in their bare legs and bare feet ran through the moat in the dark. They ran into the thistle and made such a noise um, in the thistle that the guard was roused and the day was saved. I can imagine it too. <laughs> Quackgrass. Uh, we were told last week in the feedback, thank you, that uh, some people didn't know that quackgrass is not just a vigorous growing um, plant that makes your garden look bad. It's an allelopath. It slows other plants' growth down. Right. The, uh, the chemicals that the root leaches as it grows stop the growth or slow the growth of other plants. And that's a technique that a lot of plants use. A lot of plants are allelopathic, including sunflowers, including mums. You've heard the black walnut, but black walnut. Norway maple is Norway also. Maples, yeah. Here's bindweed. This is great bindweed with the big morning glory, large flower on it. Uh, what you're looking at there, the white piece that we took out, we dug out from the ground. Um, if you can see on the right hand side where Steve's pointing for us, the, the stems are, th the, the, the white part is thicker and over on the left it's thinner. You might think, well, it's growing that way. No, the part on the left is the root that's coming from the storage root. And as it approaches the soil and becomes warmer 
and gets closer to where there are leaves on it, it begins packing in the starches and getting thicker. So you have to know that as a weed gets close to the surface, as a weed approaches its, its energy source, the leaves, it gets bigger. So you want to get down into the ground and get some root out too. This is field vine. We, this is the one we probably see the most, Janet and I. Yeah, it's, a, it's the same, same genus, so it's a cousin. It has a morning glory flower, but it's smaller. And uh, thank goodness, yeah. uh, it, it's a little easier to control. A little. But it's still the same thing, a running root that comes from where the point of the trowel is, that comes from deep down in the ground and keeps resupplying what's up above. So we take out as much root as we can. What you see there, we take out. But we know that, we, that the storage root is deeper and we know that we have to starve it out. We have to keep coming back. If we're not persistent, it will be. We can't dig far enough down to get some of those. No, no. Um, there's a wonderful book called uh, All About Weeds by Edwin Rollins Spencer. I was going to grab the book, but I think I'll stay here. Okay. You want me to go get it? No, that's okay. It might be underneath three other books. Um, Edwin Rollins Spencer wrote the book All About Weeds, and Dover Press brought it back from uh, being out of print a while ago. It's a chapter on each weed, and it tells you about how they're handled in agricultural fields that can be of great help to us um, in gardens. And one of the things that they call for for bindweed is clean cultivation. It means take out all you can. Take everything. And out. then continue to turn the soil, till the soil, and drag the roots out for a good two seasons to get, to get rid of it or get it down to a dull roar. One plant that tends to make people feel like, oh my gosh, um, got bindweed. is bindweed is on the top with the shield-shaped leaf with the two little projections at its base. Buckwheat also will climb up. It's got a heart-shaped leaf and little teeny tiny flowers. They never open as, as um, trumpets. It's an annual weed, wild buckwheat. And it'll, it'll grow like it's bindweed. It'll grow that it'll fast. Wrap up I mean, things. you it is, it, it is, it can be confusing. It's nice to have nice weeds. It's nice to have things. It doesn't take much okay. to confuse me. Pokeweed is our American native. Pokeweed is poke salad. Poke salad, Annie. People might remember the song. Poke is one of the first things to come out of the ground. The uh, reddish brown leaves you saw with the dandelion when we started the presentation today were poke weeds. And because people were quite often starved and maybe even going in towards scurvy from vitamin deficiency in the spring, they would grab the first things coming up and eat them. But it takes at least two boilings and pouring off the water to get the um, the toxins out of pokeweed, and yet people would eat it. Well, who was the test subjects? That's yeah. what I want to know. So pokeweed is a big native plant. We'll come back to that later. And then there are, of course, the weeds we invite. The four o'clock, the uh, flowering tobacco that you put in the garden and it starts coming up in the cracks in your sidewalk. And you say, isn't that cute? Until no. you trip on it. Yeah, it's not cute. I get out my boiling water and start pouring it on. Boiling things. water works really well. Yeah, take your tea kettle and just pour a section of, of a sidewalk and, and parboil those guys right out of existence. Um, other weeds, now you might not think of it if you live in the north like we do, but this is amaryllis, turned loose in a Florida garden and becoming a weed. You see it's coming up everywhere. So we can invite plants and if we don't know that they have a tendency to spread around, we end up seeding in our own weeds. This is a champion of them. That this, uh, there are so many pond people that regret putting in this cute little bugger. Yeah, it's Hootinia. Some people call it the Hootinanny plant because it tramples around so widely. The type chameleon has this pretty leaf on it and people go, oh, that's so pretty. Um, yeah. In the species, it's a green leaf with maybe a little bit of red at different seasons. But it's a runner. It is a ramp. An aggressive runner. Um, aggressive in that it not only runs quickly, but very quickly forms two and three layers of roots in the soil. Uh, so there's a horizontal running root and sometimes two or three stories of running root in the, in the ground. Um, so we, uh, we recently went to a, a nephew's home. He and his wife had just bought this home and they were having a, a, a housewarming party. And people looked out the window and saw that plant and said, oh, that's so pretty. Could I have some of that? I was so glad to hear that they didn't give anyone any hutinia. The hutinia is the... Is most everything you see there is hutinia. Oh, there's Show what used to be there, Steve. 
See the astilbe? See, astilbe? Can you pick it up? See the astilbe that's in there? Can you see the bleeding heart still surviving? So, otherwise, the dart is all hootinia. All hootinia. And that's what it does. It takes over and is very, very hard to get out. Here it is, and this someone put it by their mailbox, and I asked, it was uh, someone who had asked me to come and give them some ideas for their yard. And I hate to walk into somebody's house, and the first thing I tell them is you have to take a plant out. But I said, please, please, please take that plant out. It, it gets into things like that Rudbeckia next to it. Here's a Rudbeckia black-eyed Susan uh, that I'm having to ditch out of the client's garden because it is full of, see, I've pushed, pushed the leaves, it's full of hutinia. Underneath it are okay. all of those roots. That's those two, three layers of roots. And to Teresa's question earlier about do we take all roots out, not the fine roots in there, but I'm going to take every root that looks like hutinia and smells like hutinia out of that area because it's very easy to identify by its smell. It's kind of an acrid, sharp smell. This, uh, a root like a, like this is something we would try to take out. Something finer like that we're not as concerned with. Yeah, we're concerned with those starch thorn roots. And it's a sneaky plant. Here we have lily, lily bulbs. And you go, oh, look at that root on that lily. That is not the root of the lily. That's the hutinia. Going it's grown right through, through and around where the new lily bulb was forming and making itself look like a lily bulb. This is why we tell people, you know, must your roots. know your roots and you must, when you're cleaning out a bed, when you've got a bad weed, you must take your plants down to bare root. And when you did that, you would see that the lily, none of the lily, lily bulb roots are white. And you would find that this one smells different. Uh, there was a quick question about why, why invasive plants are allowed to be sold. I just it, all it, all all plants all plants have tendencies to be invasive when they're in a good place. All plants, they uh, that's what plants do. They colonize areas, so it's difficult to say we can't plant something because it's invasive. Sell something because it's invasive. Our native jewelweed is invasive. Our native coreopsis is invasive. Poison ivy is invasive. Sorry for going to yep. the chat. I knew I yep. shouldn't have done that. Sorry. Okay. Steve is reading the chat and he's taking I should control be of my screen. Click the screen, please. Yep. Thank you. That went back. Yeah. I didn't do that. Okay. So oh. when I take out Hutinia, and we did take out Hutinia, actually several people who were coming to our school of gardening at the time came and helped me in this garden taking out the Hutinia that grew all through this bed. We dug it all out and then for four years, four, felt them four, um, four. Um, I came back knowing that the Hutinia was there. I patrolled for it every month when I was there. And if you look, you can see the heart-shaped leaves there coming up right at the foundation because we could not get all of the roots out where they grew flat along the foundation. We knew it was coming back there. So here's where your test of your gardener's eye. Can you see the hutinia here? You don't have to point it at this. I'm not. Knowing that I told you that it's coming up along the wall, can you see the hutinia? And once you see the one, can you see the other? So patrolling is really important on these running root plants. That leaf right there is making inches and inches of root to go further and further from that area. If you know that that's where you left it and you come back to it and you dig it over early in the year before they can start photosynthesizing, you can get ahead of these things. And then it's an aha moment. I, I figured it. it out. That's I Mackenzie. Yeah. Okay, now we can do that invasive plants. So, it, you know what, there are a lot of invasive plants that are sold, did you know? Um, I know Cindy is here and we talked a little bit during the uh, preamble to the presentation about, uh, about uh, ground ivy, Creeping Charlie. Um, did you know that that is sold as a hanging basket plant in California? Uh, it's a non-native plant, but it's a very pretty plant. I've lost control. It's a very pretty plant when it's, uh, and it's a very drought tolerant plant, so they sell the darn thing. If Hutinia is in an old huge rose, do you just keep them picked off? Um, if you've got any running root plant in a plant that you're not going to dig up and move, and it is difficult to dig up some of those old roses, then you chase it, you dig it all the way up to the crown of the, of the desirable plant and in as far as you can, and then you just keep coming back to the crown of that plant and plucking it where it shows up, and you can kill it uh, by starving the same way that I killed it there along the foundation of that house. 
Um, if there are questions, if you want to raise your hand, if you've got a question you want to voice, that would be good. Um, someone has taken Houtini out 15 years ago and it still comes up. Um, yes, especially if it's got itself deep into some roots and you let it go for even a couple of weeks. Um, you know, we asked about sifted soil. I did sift the soil from one area where we put in the drain because I was taking the Houtini out, out and was determined right. not to get in. In the lily of the valley, I think you did. A little I didn't bit. sift that. No, you didn't. There was a question about preen. Um, yes, we'll have to roll up to it. Yeah. Um, Barbara says, what's your opinion of using organic preen for crabgrass, which is corn gluten that supposedly prevents seeds or crabgrass from sprouting? Um, uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about we'll talk a lot about preen in a little in in, a, in just a couple of minutes. Um, preen is a pre-emergent chemical and it is a name of a chemical. It's there is no organic preen. There is corn gluten meal, which is a pre-emergent made from the gluten taken from corn. Um, I think that the pre-emergents are good if they're used as pre-emergents. If you put them down where you have a seed problem to keep the seeds from sprouting because that's what they do. But to use them again and again and again is to say that you've got a problem with new seeds coming in that you might need to be doing something else. It, it might be one of those chemicals that also build up in the soil. soil. They've seen damage in hosta beds and that. Uh, yeah, from preen. From, from preen. From preen, Not which is surflan or, or treflan. Yeah, sorry. Um, corn gluten meal, is a, it's a, uh, it breaks down and it's a nitrogen source but it is not as effective as stopping some things. If you, uh, if you look into that on the, on the internet, look for um, comparison, effectiveness, preen, corn gluten meal, you'll find some studies that show that you're only stopping about 60 to 70% of the seeds from germinating with corn gluten meal, whereas the pre-emergence will stop more of them. And there are certain types of weeds that each of them don't stop well. So they can be good, but they shouldn't be used and used and used and used. A couple of hands. Got a hand. Let's try Julie there. She's at the top of the list. Uh, Julie, I don't see a microphone for you, so maybe we aren't able to do a hand raise, Julie. Um, but um, we can look for your question. Um, we'll look for your question. Lesser here. salandine oh, okay. has now gotten it amongst my ostrich fern and dandelions. Did I have to dig it and throw it? Okay, oh, if we're going to read it, we have to read it. I'm sorry. To get it. Okay, lesser celandine. That's a buttercup relative. If it's gotten into other plants like ostrich fern, do I have to dig and throw them away? Most of the time you do. It's better to do that. You can, for, for really precious plants, you can rinse the roots and clean anything off of them. But most of the time, if I have something that runs and multiplies quickly, like ostrich fern and others with it, I'll throw everybody out or kill everybody by smothering rather than take the time to clean them out. Okay. Maureen. So Maureen, you have a question? question? Maureen? I have lily of the valley that has grown up through all of our ground cover. Uh, do you think in order to get rid of it, we have to dig up that entire bed? Um, if you, lily of the valley is something that does either take digging or does take more than a year's smothering to kill. So I would, and, and I have, when we're taking lily of the valley out, I have pulled out desirable plants, clean them out and put them in a separate place so that I have a nursery to restock the area. And then I've smothered the entire area. Um, in some cases, when the smothering is not effective and we're ready to plant again, because it's a year later, I have to do some digging as well. But it is a very persistent plant. And it is a spring plant. It comes up early, it lives early, its leaves get senescent and ugly looking sometimes by the end of the summer. And so you need to deal with it early in its appearance, not wait until the middle of summer because that extends the number of years that you have to keep it smothered just to starve it out. Sorry to say that, but it is, it is truly a effective ground cover in that way. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, if you see a plant like oat grass growing in the middle of a, of a neighbor, how do you get it out without the neighbor? Oh, as in growing in the middle of some other plant? Is that what Hopefully not a neighbors. Yeah. You don't go into the neighbors. Yet. Not yes. We we we, gener we generally ask <laughs> without them. asking. Yeah, we generally get asked. Um, oh, sometimes when we have plants, a weed growing in something, there's no answer but to dig them both up to separate them. But more often than not, we can take a fork and loosen the soil on the side where the unwanted plant is, 
start peeling it away and, and lo keep loosening and taking it out. But, but quite often we do have to, when they're very, very much um, intricately entwined, we do have to take out both plants. And right now is a great time to do it. Plants don't mind coming out of the ground now. They're making root like mad. You put them back in, they just keep on going. So take it out now and, and uh, straighten it around. Give me back control of the screen and we'll keep, keep moving along here. Okay. Um, any questions we don't get to, um, Steve and I will work on a transcript so that we can, we can answer those questions afterwards. Do we want to, we're moving on, right? Yeah, I think, I okay. think we do need, how do you smother lily in the valley, someone says, with the same way we smother anything else, with the layer of, of heavy paper or cardboard. Cardboard would probably be better with lily in the valley because it's going to be there for a while with mulch on top of it to hold it down. And we usually mow it all down short first so that it can't hold the cardboard up. Also, cooking in a plastic, black plastic bag. Cooking in a black plastic bag is something that I recommend that people do when they pull weeds out that are running roots before they put them in a compost pile, is put them inside a plastic bag and let them heat up and stew for a while. Um, Lily of the Valley root, you can definitely do that too, but, um, uh, but that's in the ground, you can't do it. So we're not gonna go to any of those weeds right now. I think most people know what these are. How to eliminate purslane weed in a vegetable garden. Um, okay, so we'll get to these questions um, it, at, either at the end of the presentation as we get past the control or we'll, uh, we'll get back to you. Preventing. First thing to do is prevent them. Don't get weeds in the first place. And there are several, seven here, um, strategies that we give you. And we're going to do those one at a time. Mulch. A weed that never gets started is the best kind of weed. Mulch is your best your first and number one best defense. And not just a little scattering of mulch. We have seen people go through like Tinkerbell scattering fairy dust. Mulch should be an inch to two inches thick in order to stop weeds from coming up. And you bring it up around the crowns of the plants and you have very little space left where weeds can get started in a, in a nice clean mulch like bark. This is bark, processed bark, which is finely shredded, sometimes sold as triple shredded. Um, if you can't afford mulch or you're in a position where some people in Michigan are where they're not delivering, you can make what you have go further by putting a thin layer of newspaper down first. It's, this is not a smothering layer because any weed that is in the daylily up by my knee there, any weed that's got a running root in there can still run out. This, what this is doing is letting you put a thinner or veneer mulch on and not put on two inches. So if you want to go cheaper, then put a layer of paper, just a single layer of paper underneath your, your mulch. And then you lightly put it on. And now, here. now we don't use preen, especially not in that situation. Preen, is, preen stops seeds. It doesn't stop weeds that have already got their roots going. It doesn't stop perennial running roots at all. And it does build up in the soil. It is a herbicide. And how it works is it the granules sit in the soil, and when the soil gets moist, the granules melt, and there is a little puddle of herbicide around them. A weed seed germinating, any seed germinating nearby, puts its root into that puddle before it has any leaf, and it tends to get killed. They don't all get killed, but some of them get killed. Now, the reason we say don't use it is that it does year by year build up in the soil and gardeners make the mistake of not using it just when they've got a new vegetable garden that's got a lot of purslane in it and they need to keep it down for a year or so while they get it under control. They keep using it year after year after year and the plants begin to show it. Botanical garden directors and horticulturists will tell you that. Um, do you remember when we walked in Niagara Falls with uh, when uh, Larry was down there as the director, he's down in Florida now. Oh. And he pointed out the Pachysander bed to us. How pale it was starting to yeah, get. Yeah, we looked, we looked at the Pachysander bed and said, what's with the Pachysandra? What's with the stripes of yellow in the Pachysandra? And he looked up and he said, oh. He said, well, that's a, a new bed of Pachysandra relatively. It's a rectangular bed, but it goes across where there used to be three round annual beds. And those annual beds were being treated with preen every year. And the Pachysandra that crosses the old line is yellow and the other is green. So it's a problem because people use it a lot. It's also a problem because it's expensive. This is Weeds of the Northeast, which we recommend um, it's highly. It's a really good book. Um, we, uh, we went to a workshop with Andy Senesek in the bottom corner there. He is an author. I don't understand why he's not on the, on the 
title page. On yes, the he cover. should have been. But he is an author, and he's on the author page. And uh, a Andy brought weeds to the class for we could all so we could all identify them. He's a wonderful guy who runs at or ran at uh, Cornell University the weed research area, growing weeds of all kinds in beds and doing studies on how long it took to weed, which things work best on weeds. And he proved not just once, but repeatedly, it seemed to be repeatedly, that to put fabric on does not stop weeds. Kidding. It increases your cost and increases the amount of time required to weed afterwards because the weeds grow on top. And through. Those are growing on and top. under. And they grow under and they squib out between the, the sidewalk. The smallest and the little crack. Yep. So he proved that weeds don't work because they, the, weed, the fabric doesn't work because weeds will grow on top of it. All of those weeds came off of that fabric growing on top of it. Um, this book has in it identification of the plant in all of its stages as it's coming up from a seedling up in the top right corner, um, what its leaf looks like, what the roots look like, what the seeds look like, how, to, how, to, how best to control it. Just this week, one, uh, someone who's here today, Michelle, sent me this picture and said, is this, you know, I keyed this out and I think it's bulbous um, uh, buttercup. This is bulbous buttercup. But look at those two leaves. So you know what? No, nope. I think you got wild geranium there, Michelle, not bulbous buttercup. That's bulbous buttercup. It can look like that when it gets into the flowering state. Someone else sent me this weed and I'm looking on this one saying it looks like Silene to me, like catch uh, fire pinks, catch pink, but without the flower, oh, I can't tell that one. I need a good book on that one. Um, so Prevention makes a difference. Oh, and I have to go back to Andy Senezek and Weeds of the North, Northeast. He also proved that a layer of mulch is the most effective, most economic thing you can do to maintain weeds. That when you put the mulch down, your weeds are going to be only in the areas where there's not mulch. Whereas if you put preen down, your weeds will be spread all throughout the bed and you'll still have to weed the whole bed. As we are speaking about mulch, so it's a question of, it used to be three to four inches of mulch, and we said one to two. Is one to two right? inches, yeah. Um, it, I, I'm not sure where three to four inches of and mulch came from. I used from. to say that to put in, in shrub beds, newly planted shrub beds without any yeah. other perennials in there. And a, and a smothering layer would be three to four inches, but one to two inches is plenty of mulch to keep seedlings from starting, from coming up. So quack grass, we, sh we showed you taking the quack grass out of this last week and, and redoing this whole bed, but it wasn't just as important, just important to take the quack grass out. It was important to put a mulch down to keep seeds from germinating, using bark in there. And then the next year using straw. Uh, there's our friend Burdette, very happy with her garden up in the top corner. And we wrote this all up. It's in Garden A to Z. You can read it about rescuing a bed or digging out perennial weeds. That's on our website. Uh, but it's important to, to think about keeping the weeds out once you take them out. And, and once your plants, if you're planting dense enough, they they shade out any weeds that will come. They'll I'll compete them if they get big enough. Yeah, the recently retired that. recently retired um, plant propagator from Mathai Botanical Gardens says I have not used mulch in years now because I've got my plants thick enough that they cover. In the spring, I will have some weeds out there and I'll take them out from between the plants that are just coming up. And then the rest of the year, they take care of it itself. So it's a living mulch to grow your plants close enough together that they, they uh, crowd out other weeds. Another, another defense, prevention. Water, only where you need. That's where, where when we're planting, you make those planting water rings so you can just target that area. The more water you spread out, the moister the soil, the easier it is for weed seeds that propagate and move in to try to get some of those nutrients. Yeah, so spot it saves water, you money. spot water, water where the plant is, not everywhere in the bed, and let the plant grow out to that area. It, it may take you longer to water now, but your work later, you're saving. Yeah, um, it's also true that um, in, in reference to this as being a way of prevent weeds, don't weed after a rain. Gardeners all want to go out and weed after rain because the weeds come out so easily. But if you, if you combine that, that desire on our part with the desire to save soil, you watch the gardener, they pull the weed and then they shake the roots 
and they shake the roots right on top of the wet mulch. And they've just shaken weed seeds that got pulled up from underneath on top of the mulch. They've just seeded the area for the next time around. So either don't weed right after a rain, or for heaven's sake, do everything you can to not shake the soil off into a moist bed. It's also a good idea to not disturb the soil. Keep, they, they say keep a dust mulch if you're gonna hoe, hoe shallow. You don't wanna bring up seeds from way deep down. When we uh, dug our ditch in our old yard, uh, Janet dug in there, we had uh, turtle, the so turtle head showed up, up. and now we didn't plan it. The house was 40 years old, so it had to have been from 40 years before. It used to be an area that water ran through. A lot of seeds live a long time. Yeah. Okay, and then figure out where they're coming from and get rid of them. So in that bed where we, it was important to use mulch, it was also important to put in a edging to keep the quack grass from coming from the field mode short into the bed. And it was important when I dug this lavender out and cleaned it out of the grass that had gotten in to put a cut edge, that trench will stop roots from growing. Roots don't grow into air, but you have to do something to say, where did the weeds come from and stop them from getting back in. I'm cutting an edge there. And the popping that soil farther back in, loosen it so you could work it out, work those weed roots out. Right, you put the shovel in and then you lean back on the handle. You don't have to lean back this hard. I'm exaggerating to show you, but you lean back on the handle and that makes that soil loosen, lets you take out the weeds and leave a trench. And yeah. looking at where they came from, look at this Canada thistle. It's the tall stems by the name of the plant there. But look where else it is. The colony is running under the lawn also. You have to address it in the lawn. You can take it out of the bed, and if it just keeps creeping back in from under the lawn, you're in trouble. So you need to keep start pinching it and starving it out of the lawn, or use a herbicide if you want to do that. And on that, you would not use a pre-emergent. You would use one of the post-emergents, such as Roundup, or um, those that are named with Roundup in, in, as one of their ingredients. This plant is a creeping bell flower or bell towers or lady bells, purple. And it's creeping and that the root runs out to the side from the mother plant. And then when it can come up, forms a new tap root. See the center root on the left? On the left? On the left. See center the center root. one getting thicker? Saying, oh, I'm out from underneath. So at first it creeps and then it roots itself and then they get thicker and thicker and harder to take out. And thicker and thicker. There's the older part on top and there's a runner coming off of it, going out three, four, five feet. These are plants that once you know what they are and know that it's a perennial running root, you have to say, I'm gonna get all of that out of there and for heaven's sake, I'm going to make sure, that's what Mackenzie was so proud of, I get it, I get it. She said, I have to chase it all the way out the thin roots that are running and get the new pieces coming around the outside too. And we did successfully get it out of this garden. In this garden, it's running from the neighbors. It's running. So we have to learn to identify what those first leaves look like. See them there in the soil? And keep taking those out, not letting those grow and, and set down a taproot and start running from there. Because we're not gonna go into the neighbor's yard. Bindweed. I see a situation here that um, requires a little bit of, of uh, explanation. Can you see the black line running through the picture from the top left down toward the bottom right? That's edging. That's a black diamond edge on the edge of a bed. And the bindweed is growing deep enough that it's underneath that edge and coming up. And it's growing in the grass as well as the bed. And it's coming over the top of, the, of it on top of it all. So the story is that I can take it out of the bed, but I must keep in mind that it's in the grass too and deal with it in the grass. Um, don't bring home dirty tools. Rinse them off the place where you're using them. If you're, if you're working in your backyard in a space where you've had a problem with uh, bishop's weed, then rinse your tools off back there yep. because there's little bits of root them clean. stuck in that cake dirt. And our shoes transport weed seeds. It's amazing the way that plants can carry themselves around. Yep. And then do, as we've been telling you, recognize when weeds grow. You can prevent them by saying, that germinates in the autumn. I'm gonna kill it then. 
that one doesn't come till it's warm. I'll worry about it a little bit later. Um, which means that you have to keep gardening later in the fall. And this, earlier in the spring. Yep. This is in March in a botanical garden in, in England. And they were digging out a bulb plant because bulbs, they're out there right now. Look at them. Their, their heavy growth season is right now. If you want to get rid of a bulb plant, in this case it was um, grape hyacinth, then you have to get it when it's actively growing, just like, you, um, just like you have to cry when you try to come back. This is in my own garden in July. <coughs> when you try to weed in high summer, <coughs> everything is already established. So spring and fall are your better time to do it. And in the fall, any plant that you leave in the garden, like mums, will lift the skirts and look underneath, because underneath the skirts of this mum, there's Canada thistle coming up, as well as some nightshade. Yeah. Um, winter weeds are things that germinate in the cool weather, and this whole area is full of winter weeds, Gallinsoga, Oxalis, and um, uh, Creeping Speedwell, that should have been taken care of in the fall. I had some words with the gardener <laughs> about just exactly what not it is that you're supposed to be of. doing in October in the garden, not just wandering around um, admiring the sky and the, and the foliage colors. Um, motherwort. This one often disguises itself as a as a geranium, a desirable. Yeah, see, it kind of looks like a geranium leaf, except Quick it's look. happily and and people walk by it. But it's an Eurasian plant that was brought here for some medicinal use, and then we found out that there were better North American plants to use, so we don't use it for new mothers after after childbirth anymore. But it's a biennial; grows mostly leaf. And then it grows these little green white flowers that you don't notice, but these terribly sharp little burrs. Sharp. There you go. And the time to get that one is before it goes to seed and to get the seedlings out. So timing is important. Then there's the whole removal thing, the whole death to weed situation. So you start with pulling and when you pull, don't pull the tops off. I tell people you might as well get a goat and tether it out. Yeah, just let it eat the tops. Um, they would you, do a better job than us picking them. Yeah, we, we fork and loosen an area first, and we start from the center of the colony. There so. are tons of weeders. There's so many different kinds. And, and to us, it's personal choice, but a fork is the best. The fork is this one, which we can put in and loosen the soil. And then we'll, I'll use a hand weeder. It's in the middle with the triangular blade. Sure, it likes this. But whatever works for you to loosen the soil and get as much root as you can or to hoe off the small plants that are there. Forks can get in deeper. Forks come in different sizes and they help get the root looser. But you need to look at the root. This is oxalis. A lot of people call this clover. This is that little yellow clover. It's not a clover, it's an oxalis, also called a wood sorrel. This one is the, the, Euro, the European version. This one is the American version. They both look like little clover leaves. But if you look there to the uh, to the right of the pen tip, you'll see a runner. Can you see the white root running out? When you take something out, look for those signs. Because you might pull it out and say, I got it all. This is another of the sore of the oxaluses. It's an upright one that you often find. And it's also running, see the runners forming from the root mass? But if you just yank it up, you'll break those off and you don't know they were there. So you'll, loosen. You'll see all the brown. You'll, that's what you'll pull out and you'll think, oh, I've got everything. And then you might see a few white ones, but a lot of them break and, off. So look at the roots. And this one also roots from the stems. You can see hairy places on the stems where it's getting ready to root and keep going. So learn about it when you take it out and take as much out as you can. So when I know that tall yellow ox, oxalis spreads by runners as well as laying on the ground, when I take it out, I'm gonna loosen and make sure that I chase all of those little pieces because everyone is a new plant. The new plants grow very vigorously, usually right where you didn't dig them, like in the middle of the grasses, that's that nana grass. Yeah. Not so much. Yeah. And those are all seedlings because you didn't get them early enough and they were setting seed already. It's already out there starting to seed, so, so pay attention to and it. And that's a tough spot to, that's, if don't dig right in there. Yeah, uh, you gotta don't, hold those off. Don't loosen that sub, the compaction beneath that. Yeah, you don't want to under, the walkway. You don't want to undermine the bricks in the walkway. Now, why is it so heavy along the edge? 
because the mower on the other side of that walkway is blowing seeds from the lawn in there. Yeah. Sometimes you have to talk to your, your mowing, whoever is your mower, and say, could you just face not, it the other way? Don't blow into my beds, please. Okay, so we have different kinds of sorrel. This is another one. Its name is sorrel, but it's not a cousin, it's a rumex. And this is called sour sorrel, another one that's quite edible of the weeds. It has an elastic running root, very fine. And little bits, that little bit of green was producing that much root. I teased it all out by loosening with a fork and following the root. And if you don't do that, then it's not going to be gone. Again, just like the bindweed, see how from the root running up, it gets thicker and thicker. Once it gets some green, it starts packing away the starches right. and starts becoming a, a, a problem, an a, a evil thing. So you loosen with the fork. I've got the fork in the ground. I'm pushing down with one hand. And you're kind of bouncing, bouncing the fork it. a little bit and, and feathering. You're not yanking, you're, you're yeah. feathering. We'll post some video on this when we can figure out how to get our machines Videos. to do that. Um, Quackgrass root looks like iris root. It looks a lot like iris root. And so it's one of the plants that we have to take all the way down to bare root to sort out whose roots are whose before we put it back in. It's important to do. If you do it right once, then you're fine. I can't tell you how many times we've had professional landscapers of one um, stripe or another. Uh, the one that's coming to mind right now is the, the horticulturist at the Detroit Zoo, looking at our beds there and say, how do you keep such a clean bed? And we said, well, we started with a clean bed. I mean, that's, that's how you do it. That's you start with a clean bed. It really is. So uh, we talked a little bit before the official start of the webinar, we were talking about this diagram. When we're clearing out an area, we, we cut across it, turn the, the spade, lift up every square foot, look for those roots we're looking for and remove all of them, step back, take out another row, always stand on top of the weeds, not on top of the soil that we've dug. And yeah, do not step on the soil you dug. You'll get confused at where you were. And we use a spade with a straight blade so that we don't leave the little cutouts that a shovel with a curved blade would leave us. It would miss some parts of the garden. And if you have weed, yeah, tree roots in there, and that was the question before we got started, what happens when there's tree roots in there? You, as best you can with a fork and the spade, you dig and loosen everything you can and take them out. You mark the areas where you think you're gonna to have to come back and look for the weeds. Just keep moving back and forth. If you're working with a partner, don't have them work in the same place as you. you can work back to back. And you work back to back until there's not enough room and then one person turns the other way and works out. These diagrams were on the handout last week um, for improving the older garden. They are also available on our website on, in our uh, conference materials um, tab. When you go to download this handout, if you just stay on the site and look for the tab right next to it, it's the conference materials and you can find this uh, information there. Cleaning out the roots often means rinsing them with water. And water is is the best way to do it. I mean, Listen you can try to blow it with air if you were silly enough to do that. You'd get so messy. And we write about these things. If you go onto our website and use our search field, and right now we have four wonderful people helping us migrate pages over from our gardenazee.com to .org, so more and more pages are appearing in both places. But search both sites and you'll find these weed tips. Cultivation is another way to kill something that's already there, which means that you take a sharp object and you slice underneath you it. You hoe it, you cut it, so you a little, cut the root. This time of year, um, what would have been in the video we'd show you today if we could have gotten the video to run. Don't say that again. I'm sorry. That's three sorry. times. I, oh, You've three times, enough. okay. Yes. Um, it's you cut underneath them, just a light cut. All you're doing is cutting them to cut them loose from their roots or disturb them from their roots. And then you put a mulch on top of them. If you don't have much mulch, put a layer of newspaper, one, one sheet of newspaper and whatever mulch you do have. But little seedlings like that, you can kill by just hoeing. They're not miracle workers, they're too young. And my particular favorite hand hoe has one edge longer than the other so that when I run into a weed that is a perennial weed, I can turn the hoe sideways and pry up the longer root. So I put the hoe in and pry up. Starvation works. It just takes time. It takes a growing season. At least, depending on the weed. 
Yeah, generally, I, like, I tell people if you smother by May, you can probably plant in the fall. If you smother by September, you can probably plant the next spring. But sometimes it takes longer than that. And what it is, is it's overlapped paper. So these are sections of paper, four or five layers thick, opened all the way out, like you're hiding behind your newspaper, and then covered, covering each other by half. And we don't want the roots running in between. So the longer the root has to go through the paper before it reaches the mulch to get up through, the better. Yeah, the more starch it wastes trying to find a place to get up, the sooner you smother that plant that you've got underneath there. And then the mulch is holding it down and making it look pretty. We generally put three or four inches of mulch when we're doing a smothering mulch. Don't wheelbarrow into the paper no, put the mulch on first. If you have to wheelbarrow in, put mulch on and wheelbarrow. And then wheel the over the mulch. The paper cuts and moves real easy. You you break it that layer. You break the barrier. And you you're you're losing your smothering. Yep. Now chemical kills are using herbicides, and when you've got a deep rooted plant, um, you may want to resort to chemicals. We don't use them, but we know how to use them. Uh, and we've watched them used in a lot of places for a long time. We've certainly been to enough studies, read, read enough studies and been to enough workshops. The way that those chemicals work that kill weeds systemically is that you spray it on the weed, the leaf absorbs the chemical, in this case mostly it's glyphosate, it absorbs the chemical, makes the chemical a part of the starch that it creates, sends that starch to the root, and then the starch in the root is insoluble. The root can't use it. So the root starves. So you must spray it on by uh, label directions and let the plant die gradually. If you spray it on so heavily that the plant dies right away, then the leaf could not have moved any of that it stuff to the It didn't work. Uh, it, it, I, we've seen people mix it. Oh, I'll make it double strength. They'll do it quicker. No, it will kill the top quicker, but it doesn't kill the root at all then. Yeah, and, and many of the new formulations of Roundup since the patent ran out on glyphosate, many of the new formulations are being made by companies that are mixing it with something else and where glyphosate Roundup used to be fairly safe to use, it's now killing other plants, including trees whose roots are in the area. So we're yeah. being very careful be, with this. Do your research before deciding on which chemical if you're going to use any. Other chemicals that are not systemic are called burn down chemicals. Vinegar is one. Um, uh, herbicides based on like safers that are based on potassium at salts of potassium. Of, anyway, it's a chemical of potassium, <coughs> fatty acids. They burn the cuticle of the leaf and kill the leaf. They don't kill the root, they kill the top. And I always tell people, if you're going to do that, couldn't you just pull the weed and just keep pulling the weed? Because you're going to have to keep burning it off, too. Mm. In fact, what did, um, what did uh, Aaron say? She called and she said to Sonia, I'm reading this label, and it appears that I've just spent about $50 a gallon for vinegar. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> so we don't have a great love for the chemicals, but it does work. So it's time for us to, to wrap this up to say that your good plants are your perennial weeds too. And that uh, if you want to talk about particular weeds, and if you want, oh, and this techniques. is this is a technique for killing with Roundup where you spray through a can. I'll tell and you. And it does work. Except that if that can drips on anything else when you pick it up, then you're in trouble. Which it will. And how are you gonna kill that one in the middle of your, of your uh, crocuses? Or how are you gonna kill all of those guys? Whoops, sorry off to the side, you might just as well weed them out. So that's our, that's our time for today. We do have, uh, we, we are um, subscribers to Zoom. We're, your, your subscriptions are paying for us to be able to do that. So we can stay. If you'd like to stay for a bit and ask a question or two, we'll put them into the transcript, but we're going to end our... We will transcript the, the chat. There was a lot going on in the chat today. Yeah, yeah. And that's good. I'm really glad that is. I know it. I know it. it some people thought it was distracting, but uh, some of the questions were getting answered. And I, I think that we'll yeah. see. Yeah, we'll see. We'll send out a, a survey. Yeah, so uh, questions. And you can email us anytime on, the, on our, our website. And um, that list that Janet just went past. Can you go back? Link? Yes. Yeah. That list is not on the handout. That was just something for our That was us to say, here's our the pictures use. that we can show. 
And we showed you a whole lot of those pictures as we went about it. Poison ivy in the middle of a dwarf lilac. So let us say officially goodbye to people here. Do go to the website and download the handout if you'd like to see our list of worst weeds. And uh, come back again. If you'd like to subscribe to these, we'd really, uh, we'd appreciate the support. We think it's a pretty good deal to come for the year and spend time with other gardeners for the whole year for $75. And that's the offer that we're making up until next Friday. Um, thank you for joining us today. We're going to uh, uh, officially end the presentation right now. We'll hang out and ask, answer some questions. Okay, so it looks like I'm gonna stay and answer some questions for a minute while Steve goes and checks on the dogs. We had a dog sitter today, which was really nice. I am going to do a little changing here. Uh, for one thing, I think I will. Um, for one thing, I'm gonna make my chat window real big. You won't see it, but I'm moving something around right now to make sure that I can see more questions. And I'm gonna read the questions because that way I will be able to listen to them as we type out the answers. Okay, I'm helping a friend with her yard. Whoops, okay, they're coming in too fast. So I guess the answer is, I shall go up. Okay, there's Lily of the Valley. Um, what do I use to cover Lily of the Valley when I'm smothering it? I generally use paper and then watch for the places where it still keeps coming back. And then I might use cardboard on that area or I might dig that area out. Um, I'd like to try to clear a bed in a year, not wait and wait and wait. How long do you have to cook weed, weed seeds in black plastic and sun to kill the seeds? Until they get hot. Um, generally, it's uh, some, somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of 120 to 140 degrees. So it's gonna be summertime in the plastic before they get hot enough, but it keeps them out of the way. We often put them in black plastic bags or sometimes clear plastic bags if we have them, seal the top and then lay them flat um, on top of the asphalt in the July and we feel a little bit like um, like we're getting back at the weeds that way. Um, does smothering work with wild onion? Only if you smother for more than one year. Wild onion is a bulb. Oh, we didn't show you the pictures of the star of Bethlehem. Star of Bethlehem and wild onion are both bulb plants. They grow very early in the year and they make tiny side bulbs that when you pull out the main plant, the side bulbs may stay. And those bulbs are quite used to a dormancy. They're quite used to living without any light for the most part of the year. So unless you smother them very early in the year and very late in the year when they start coming back up again, um, the smother doesn't do anything in the middle of the year. So generally we'll smother very early in the year if we've got wild onion, after we've dug over the area, we'll smother and we'll leave it smothered until the next summer. So that's a year and a couple of months. And then we'll check and see how the area is doing. Same thing with the Star of Bethlehem. Star of Bethlehem is another allelopath, by the way. Um, so that list of weeds is not on Garden Agency site. I'll put it there. We'll get it there somewhere. Put it with the chat list. Uh, Was well, smothering six feet around a tree for a little bit of valley hurt the maple tree? Generally, if you've got a good sized tree, any size at all, uh, if, if a tree is 10 feet tall, its roots are probably at least 10 feet out around it. That's a 10 foot radius, not a 10 foot diameter. And probably even further than that if the tree is, has been there longer than that. And as long as you are not covering with uh, something that prevents water from getting in and mulch and paper lets water get in, the plant's gonna be okay. Don't smother against the trunk though, the trunk area. If there's a heavy lily of the valley, I'll dig right around the trunk to take the lily of the valley back away from the trunk, but I'm not gonna smother and cover the base of the trunk. Um, is there a way to show a photo on Zoom to you? Not during a webinar because there are too many people doing that. Um, but uh, now, for instance, we could do that. Sonia, if you are still there, if you can identify Chris and see if Chris, if there, Chris is still there, we can find out if he wants to share his screen with us. But that has to be done in smaller groups. People have been asking about design classes and design questions, and we'll definitely have to do those in smaller groups. It looks like Chris has gone. Thank you, Sonia. Um, Okay, doesn't straw have weed seeds in it? Hay has a lot of weed seeds in it. Straw does not have much weed seeds. Straw is the bottom of the plant after they've cut the, the rich hay from the top of the grass. So generally straw has far fewer seeds in it, but there's no way you can keep all the seeds out of it. Um, 
We use marsh hay purchased at a, a nursery that's close to weed free. We've heard that about marsh hay, um, that it's that's weed free, but I've never used it myself, so I'm not sure. And um, uh, we don't have a, a steady source of marsh hay because we don't have any um, salt wetlands near us. Can you take over for this, Steve? Yeah. How deep should a trench be if you're digging a trench to keep things out? Um, we showed a picture using carpet runner to help keep things out. The trench should be as deep as the running roots are of the plant that you're keeping out. For most lawn grasses, especially lawn grasses that are mowed regularly, a four inch edge is probably just fine. So a four inch trench works. But for some roots, raspberries, quackgrass. Canada thistle, yeah, canada pine thistle. weed. You may have to go deeper than that. But you'll see that when you dig into the area and you look at how deep your running roots are running. Not how deep they penetrate down, but the running, the layer, the layer that they're running in. The botanical name of wild lettuce is Latuca, L-A-T-U-C-A. I don't think it's vulgaris. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, thanks, Gail. Latuca virosa. Thank you, Gail. It's probably Gail Morell. Uh, squill, squill or scylla, Siberica, just showed up in my garden from the old house. Should I keep it or get rid of it? I happen to think squill is a I delightful it. thing. But it does spread, and it is a bulb plant that once it spreads, you're probably not going to get rid of it. It upsets a lot of people because it spreads into and coexists with the grass. And as the squill leaves die back after they bloom, it makes the grass look yellow, and that drives some people crazy. So if it's going to drive you crazy, get it out. Get it out before it's too late. I'm trying to prevent some non-native spread on my property that borders a watershed. So she's questioning about planting mostly natives and pollinator friendly, and that's good. I'm glad that you do that. Um, Especially along the water edge, too many, yeah. too much water grass goes right down to the water. Yeah, and, and uh, it is, if you can choose a native, that's great. Uh, we have a lot of plants that last week we were talking about turtle head and uh, uh, talking with um, a taxonomist who studied turtle head. Probably only one of the turtle heads was, what is, was it, turtle? unambiguously native in Michigan before European colonization. Um, and the other two came in afterwards. So there's, there's always those questions of what's really native. Um, dealing with heavy clay. Uh, definitely when we talk about soils and planting, we'll talk about heavy clay, but the best thing you can do with heavy clay is to break it into clods. We showed it being broken into clods last week. Clods, don't try to break it up break it into clods. You don't try to till it. Right. And put organic matter on top of that chunky, cloddy mess. Not sand. Yeah, not sand, but organic matter. And let that degrade into the spaces between the clods. And, and it will amazingly quickly break down into pretty good soil. Clay um, is not bad soil necessarily. Oh, it's rich soil it, in many clay. It holds more nutrients. It has finer particles with more yeah. stuff could stick to it. Its problem is that it packs down because it's finer particles and so you want to get the organic matter mixed into it. Um, I have any clay. I wish I had made raised beds years ago. Yes, years ago is always a time that That's we should have shell, done something. Think, yeah. right? uh, I've been making and using an Epsom salt vinegar solution that works pretty well to burn things down. I'm sure that's what it is uh, because anything with vinegar in it is going to do that. Uh, how about poison ivy in the middle of a dwarf lilac? We, um, I, we have that a lot in our neighborhood. There's a lot of poison ivy in the neighborhood and it runs in the shrubs. Um, we, we weed it like it is a weed. So we take the roots, the rooted part out of the outside and chase the root in underneath the lilac. We're probably not going to be able to get it all the way in and we're not gonna to wanna to dig up the whole lilac. So you mark the space and you keep coming back and clipping it off every time you see green. Um, and as we're getting used to protecting our hands and washing our hands, you just protect yourself so well when you're working with poison. I, I won't even work with Steve it. Steve is very sensitive to poison ivy, so I do the digging of poison ivy. Um, I wear um, plastic gloves um, on, on my hands, and I pull, pull, and then I put my gloves on, and I put, pull a sock that I've cut the toes out. I pull the sock over my hand so that my elbow to my knuckles is covered with an old tube sock. And when I'm done digging after 15 or 20 minutes, and that's about all I do before I, I get back out there, I peel the sock and my glove off 
Sorry, I'm just wearing the plastic gloves anymore. I'm not putting my gloves back on. I, I peel the sock and the glove off and throw them and the poison ivy all the way in a black plastic bag marked poison ivy so that nobody will open it up thinking that it's organic matter that you put in the compost. Large scale patches of weeds. Um, sure, you can smother you can smother weeds in the in the lawn by smothering. It, it'll look to people like you're making a bed in the middle of your lawn, but it yeah. works to do and that. Then you have to reseed the lawn, and that you you could aerate and try to re just stick in the lawn, lawn itself first. Yeah. Then the smothering, unless and if you're going to make that into a bed anyway, yeah. Then go ahead. Well, I think it's just smother. trying to get the weeds out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's still some. See, when do you know how to use a board to avoid soil compaction or just stand where you need to? Um, whenever you've been digging in the ground and, and loosened up the soil, every time you step on it, you're compacting it. So I try to dig in front of myself and back out of a garden. And if I can do that, then I can walk in and out until I'm done and then I can loosen the soil as I go out. But if I'm in a garden, digging, weeding, planting, and I'm coming in and out the same path all the time, and that path is occupied by a lot of plants, I'm going to put a board there so that I don't have to, to loosen right among the plants I just put in. If you can't watch the scheduled sem seminar on Saturday, you watch it at another time on our YouTube channel. Um, we send out the, as we post the video onto YouTube, it takes some editing to do that because we have to check the audio and, and a bunch of, and we have to cut off the stuff that doesn't belong at the beginning, et cetera. Um, we post it to YouTube and we send um, an email to all of the people on the webinar list with the, the link that says, here's where it is. And it will remain there. Uh, these uh, six from these five so far and one next week will remain on our YouTube channel for everybody to see. From then on, the subscribers will have the key to see the ones that have been made from um, webinar number seven on um, through the year. And they'll be in the private area. Uh, the lawn has a whole section of bitter crest that has bloomed. What shall we do? There are, there are seeds in there. They're going to wait for the cool. They're going to bloom in the cool season now. Uh, and then they're going to wait for the fall. Keep that area overseeded and aerated. Keep your lawn growing well so that the lawn can fill in and shade the crest out. It won't germinate if there's no light reaching it. A couple of hands up. Oh, good. Uh, Cindy, are you still there, Cindy? Yes, I'm here. Uh, can you I go back to the printing tally again? Sure. Yeah, uh, my lawn is pretty free of it now. Good. Because my soil is a lot richer than the neighbors, so their creeping Charlie keep coming on to the, uh, through the fence. So what can I do? A creeping Charlie creeps, it's called ground ivy, creeping Charlie, gill over the ground, and ale hoof. Those are all the common names for glycomo heteraceae, and it creeps across the top of the ground. Um, and so the way to keep it from creeping across a line, like a property line, is to keep a, a no man's land where nothing is growing, a path along the fence that you just hoe or pull all the time. There, there's no way that I've found other than that to keep it out because it will crawl over barrier in the ground. So what you need is you need a horizontal barrier. And um, a path is, especially if it's at the back of the garden, a path is just as good as, as yep. uh, having plants there, really. Thanks for asking, Michelle. Let's we, I, okay. Uh, Cindy, we, okay. <laughs> Michelle? Michelle? Are you still there, Michelle? Yeah, I am. Uh-huh. You have a question? I didn't know I had my hand up. Uh, okay. I can't remember what my question was now. <laughs> I'm, oh. glad, I'm glad you sent that picture because that was great going through the key for Missouri Botanic Gardens to look and see what oh. kind of I think it, and it definitely is the wild geranium because I looked at the root and it looks just like that big root, you know, that one that blooms pink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Good. I'm glad. I you just want to say I think Michelle's hand was up for a long time and we just missed it. So sorry about that, Michelle. That's no problem. Thanks, Sonia. Thanks, Sonia. Yeah. Um, Gretchen is spading out a whole bed to get rid of vinca. Should I smother the area for a year instead of putting mums, et cetera, back in the area? If you dig out vinca, if you're digging back and forth across the if whole you're, area, if you're diligent. You probably are not going to have very much coming back up. So you can plant the area after you dig it. But do not turn your back. Keep looking for it and plucking and the pieces pluck as they come up. That's all. 
how do you get rid of nuts edge? You dig, you dig the nuts edge out and then you look for the nut. You keep going down, look for the older nut if you're, plant, if you're digging it late in the year, but if you're digging it when it's blooming, it's not as, uh, the nuts are much smaller and easier to get out. I've just gotten done in year two of getting nut sedge out of a uh, bed of myrtle, a vinca. It's a ground cover <coughs> that they wanted to have there and the nut sedge had gotten in. And I dug it in July of both years because trying to get all of the nuts was pretty hard to do, but the plant itself wastes its own nut as it grows up in the spring and forms a new nut for the second half of the summer. So if you can get it while it's blooming in July, you can get more of it out than otherwise, but I do dig it out. Um, I was told by a couple of um, uh, people at, a, at an extension meeting where they were teaching us about various herbicides that had been released that there is a combination of uh, trimec plus something that seemed to work well on nut sedge but i uh, so you might want to look that one up there it would have been a michigan state bulletin that released the uh, study results is blood root invasive and the best way to control it blood i root. love blood root so i wouldn't even try to control it personally except for if it went to a spot where we didn't want it Blood root is invasive in that definition of the term. In, in our, at our old house where we had blood root in the shade, where blood root belongs, quotation marks, and the darn silly thing kept seeding itself out into the sun. So there would be these blood roots coming up where I would tell them, you don't belong out here, you're gonna get all scorched. So it does spread around like that, and, uh, but it spreads by seed and more slowly by expanding its clump. So I think it's fairly easy to control um, just by um, keeping mulch around the areas where you don't want it to, to show up. What is the name of the vine that climbs a tree and wraps around each and bittersweet and kills it? That's bittersweet and bittersweet. Oriental bittersweet. And uh, well, even well, the native, it could be the native. Yeah, too, the native but wraps most too. likely the. If it's big and it's a killer, it's generally the oriental bittersweet, and it is a woody plant and like grapevine, you have to go to the base and kill the base of the plant, um, and because it's woody. And because it has a, uh, a very strong root, I mean, it, it holds on very strong to the ground. It's difficult to pull. So most people are, are treating it by either repeated cutting or cutting the stem at ground level and then painting that stump with a herbicide um, that's absorbed into it. Uh, so uh, brush be gone, poison ivy killer, and uh, concentrated Roundup are used to do that, one, or one of those uh, uh, concentrations. And it has to be done sh very shortly after the cut for it to be absorbed into the root. Now, a friend who has a lot of bittersweet on her property, she's got 40 acres and has been dealing for decades, decades. clearing them out, has found that it is more effective to cut it repeatedly than to cut it and paint it. So in her, in her um, dealing with it, she said, in the areas where I came through and I cut it, and then I came through and I cut it again, it worked better than when I cut it and painted it. So try it one way or the other. It's a, it's a battle. Bittersweet is a real it battle. It is a battle. And it's going to be a battle in, in some of our wooded areas, yeah. uh, walking through Highland Wreck like we do a lot. We're seeing it more and more. Yeah. Is moss dealt with like weeds? Moss mm -hmm. can be dealt with like weeds. We have moss in one place in our yard. And we like how it outlines the stones. So we leave it alone. But moss generally is in a place because other plants can't grow in that place so well. So moss usually occurs where it's too shady or, too the, moist. or the drainage is uh, making it too moist. Drainage. Or sometimes where it's, uh, where it's too acid. Not usually the case in the Great Lakes, but sometimes where it's too acid. So if moss is, is in an area and you don't want it there, you look for one of those situations and see if you can, can change it so that other plants can grow there better. How do you get rid of oxalis in the lawn? That's one of the things that is bad about lawns is that it's a huge area and the plants are growing in there. You generally have to beef up the lawn as much as you can until the lawn is growing very thick and then the remaining patches of weed are probably going to have to be dealt with by digging out or by using a herbicide on them. Sometimes the weeds in the lawn, some are short, so when you mow longer, they get shaded out. Yeah. And some are tall. <laughs> yeah. And if you mow shorter, yeah. I, yeah. we try to mow long ourselves yeah. anyway. Um, uh, suggestions for killing or controlling Phragmites. I'm going to hand that one off to some of the, the uh, people who 
oh, I've forgotten the name of the site. Um, there is a group centered in uh, the Fum area of Michigan that has done a lot of research on controlling Phragmites and they have done more than we have done with them. So I generally send people to their site and I can't remember the name of the site right now. I'll put it into the, into the transcript. And it looks like all the questions. Okay, I think we're huh? masses of bittercress. Smother the whole area and get something else growing into that area where the bittercress is because it must have been bare ground in the fall. Uh, and it, either a mulch has to be on top of there when the season is cool or you have to have some plants going on that. Yeah, the DNR does have information on the Frank Mighty students yes. too, and, and the group in the in in St. Clair County up by Port Huron in the Thumb does, I think, Work uh, with the feed a lot of information into the DNR. Really, really glad that you were here. Thank you all, everybody. Um, this has been fun. Yep. Um, we will. Uh, we're we'll looking talk. forward to keep doing it. We'll talk to you again through the week on our website, and we'll see you at the next webinar. See you next week. Roots.